Hello, today we want to answer the question, why is the sky blue? Probably one of the most common questions that everybody has asked at some point in their life. So the quick answer is that the sky is blue because of a process called Rayleigh scattering. What that means is essentially the sunlight that's coming in is scattered off of the uh, atmospheric gases that we have in the upper atmosphere. Our atmosphere is predominantly nitrogen in two nitrogen molecule, two atoms of nitrogen together, and oxygen, O2, which is two atoms of oxygen bonded together. Now in the upper atmosphere, these gases interact with the incoming sunlight in such a way that the blue light, the blue part of the spectrum, is actually scattered, meaning it's redirected, so to speak, to our eyes more than the other colors. We'll talk about it in a minute, but this process also explains why not only is the sky blue, but it explains why our sunsets are red. So to understand in a little more detail, we have to roll up our sleeves and dive a little deeper. So what is light anyway? Light is an electric field oscillating and a magnetic field also oscillating. So you can see in this picture, you have an electric field, which is a sine wave, and a magnetic field, which is a sine wave. Now, uh, they're, they're oriented 90 degrees relative to each other. So the degree of propagation is 90 degrees from the electric field and the magnetic field. Now this is, I think, a better picture here because it shows the arrows. You can think of these little electric fields as little arrows, little vectors which switch direction and they oscillate very rapidly, right? Uh, the, the faster the oscillation, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy of the wave, and the bluer the color of the wave and 90 degrees to that, you have a magnetic field component oscillating as well. Now it turns out that all light, we call it electromagnetic radiation, all light, x-rays, light, infrared, all of it is all electromagnetic radiation. It's electric fields oscillating 90 degrees to magnetic fields and propagating 90 degrees. You can see the direction of propagation on the figure here, 90 degrees to those, uh, to those electric and magnetic fields. All right, now the thing you need to realize is that a uh, electric field, when it oscillates, it pushes electrons around. It can push any charged particles around. So that is how all light behaves. What you learn when you study Maxwell's equations is that an oscillating or a changing electric field actually causes a magnetic field to, to occur. But then an oscillating magnetic field also causes an electric field to, to occur. So the two go together and that's why they propagate together because a changing electric field causes a magnetic field and a changing magnetic field also causes a changing electric field. So together they propagate through space. Now the thing you need to know is that when an electric field comes in the presence or, or near a charged particle like an electron, like an electron surrounding a nitrogen molecule, it begins to push those electrons around. If you think of the electric field being my finger, it's going to push charged particles. It'll push electrons in one way and protons in another way. So as soon as that wave hits one of these nitrogen molecules or oxygen molecules, it begins to shake the electron cloud which is surrounding these molecules. So you can kind of think of it as what happens is the energy of the incoming wave sort of gets absorbed by the electron cloud because it's it's going into shaking the electron cloud. And then secondarily, anytime you have an electron that's accelerating, meaning, meaning oscillating back and forth, it re-radiates photons out or electromagnetic radiation from, uh, from the electrons. In fact, that's how all antennas work. You, you see a long antenna on a car. The reason they're long and slender is because we have a circuit that sets up oscillations of the electrons in this long antenna, and that, ch that causes a changing electric field and a changing uh, magnetic field, and then they can detach from the antenna and propagate as waves through space, right? And the same sort of thing is happening with the atoms in the, uh, the molecules in the upper atmosphere. When a photon of light hits the nitrogen molecule, it shakes it, and when it shakes that electron cloud, the electrons re-radiate uh, re-radiate electromagnetic waves into space. But here is the kicker, right? Not all incident uh, fre frequencies and wavelengths can actually shake the electron cloud as good as the other colors. It turns out that red and longer wavelengths aren't able to actually shake the electron cloud as, as easily, and the shorter wavelengths actually can do a much better job of shaking the electron cloud. So that's why we see the blue light scattered, because the blue light is what is able to shake the electron cloud, so to speak, to oscillate it, where the uh, red light is not as effective at doing that, so it passes right through. So I'll go into a little more detail in just a second, but that is the big picture. 
The sunlight is a mixture of all different wavelengths. Different colors that you see with your eyes are just different lengths of the waves. When you look at the original figure of electromagnetic waves, you see the Greek letter lambda, and the physical length of the wave just corresponds to different colors. But different lengths of waves can actually uh, put their energy into shaking those electron clouds from molecules in the atmosphere more or less efficiently. The longer wavelengths, the reddish wavelengths, tend to pass right through the gases and so they don't really get scattered. But the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, and it's able to shake the electron cloud. It's able to put its energy into the electron cloud more efficiently of those molecules and start to shake them. They begin to then re-radiate more or less in all directions. It's not exactly in all directions, but more or less in all directions. And the color that they re-radiate is the bluish colors. So when we look up at the sky, we see blue light because the incident sun uh, light hits that uh, those atoms and molecules up there and shakes them, and then they're re-radiating blue down to the ground. But all the red colors, they just passed right through those gases. So these are more or less the colors of the rainbow. I left a couple of them out, like I left orange out. You get the point here. Red is the longest wavelength that we typically see. And the wavelength of red light is a, is a range, but it's about 650 nanometers. What does that mean? That means if you look at the graphic for electromagnetic waves, it is the distance in meters between two different uh, crests or two different troughs of the wave. And it's physically in meters. So 650 nanometers means 650 billionths of a meter. So really, really, really small wavelengths. Now, yellow light has a wavelength of about 570 nanometers. So it's a shorter wavelength, right? Green, I'll just go down the list here, about 510 nanometers, so a shorter wavelength still. Blue light has a shorter wavelength still, 450 nanometers. You should start to see a pattern here. What do you think violet's gonna be? It's gonna be even a shorter wavelength, 380 nanometers. So you can see that the different colors of the light that you see just correspond to different wavelengths. The red colors that you see in everyday life are just simply longer, uh, longer distances between the, the peaks of the waves of those electromagnetic waves that you see, whereas the bluer and the violet colors are just waves that have a shorter physical wavelength, okay? Now here's the thing, from quantum mechanics we learn that uh, when you go into a shorter and shorter and shorter wavelength, you have higher energy. Higher energy. Right, so you have red, which is relatively low energy for each individual photon. Yellow, a little bit more energy. Green, a little bit more energy. Blue, a little bit more energy. Violet, a little bit more energy. What do you think comes after violet? Ultraviolet. We don't see ultraviolet, but ultraviolet is just a little bit of a smaller wavelength than this, which means it's even a higher energy than the violet, and that's why it can give you a sunburn. That's why ultraviolet we worry about for our skin, but we don't worry about What's on the other side of red? What do you think is on the other side of red? It's infrared, which is a little bit longer wavelength than this. The reason I'm putting this out to you here is because I want to try to explain to you why some of these wavelengths are able to oscillate the electron clouds of the upper atmosphere gases, and some aren't. And in order to do that, I'm going to need a prop. All right, here I have a prop. This is not a molecule, but it's, it's a good way to learn about why this works, okay? So everything in nature has some sort of resonant frequency. This, you can think of a child on a swing set. We also can call it a pendulum. It's free to swing, and when I pull it back one way, gravity tends to bring it back to some, to some neutral position, but then it, all, it, it shoots past it, and then it goes this way and this way until it eventually slows down. If I try to put energy into this, you can think of this pendulum sort of as the electron cloud surrounding like a nitrogen molecule or something like this, right? I can push on this thing. Now we all know from pushing children that there's a nice cadence that we push with to get the child to go on the swing, you know, very nice and efficiently. If you don't push at the right frequency or wavelength, because wavelength is related to frequency, then you don't push the child as well. So let's see what happens if I push too fast. If I push this thing, then I'm still beating with my hand. Whoop, oh, it went up a little bit and I'm still, I'm wasting energy. You see what's going on? I'm hitting it, but I'm still oscillating my hand. I'm still oscillating my hand, it's kind of hard to do, but I'm still oscillating my hand in between the hits, right? Like this. And so every time I'm, 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 I'm waving my hand without contacting the swing, I'm wasting energy. So I'm not putting energy in very efficiently in here. Most of the energy is lost 
from the incident photons. So uh, that is one example of, of not being able to put energy into a system very effectively. Let's change it the other way, and let me push with a very long wavelength or a very, very low frequency and see what that does. So I push it, and then I'm still coming back, and I'm not matching it at all. I'm really slow, you see, and I'm not able to really couple energy into it very effectively because sometimes it's way over here whenever I get to the point where I would want to hit it and I'm out of sync with it, in other words. So I'm not able to couple energy too well into it or too, too nicely into it when I'm pushing too fast or too slow. But if I go at exactly the right frequency, then I can put a nice percentage of my energy from my hand into oscillating this thing. Because as soon as it comes back to my hand, I'm ready to push again. This is basically called resonance. This is the same reason why like an opera singer can break a glass because every thing made of matter has some sort of resonant frequency. The glass has electric forces between the molecules in there, and when you push, microscopically push on the glass, it wants to spring back. And if you give your voice the exact right frequency, then it can get those oscillations and the glass moving really rapidly, and you can break the glass. So why does this apply to why is the sky blue? Because we have different colors of the rainbow. We have long wavelengths, uh, which it corresponds to low frequencies. These are low frequencies. And then we have high frequencies, uh, uh, which are shorter wavelengths, right? And higher energy, right? So these do not all, they're not all able to put energy into the electron cloud shaking as well. The longer wavelengths are just not pushing at the right rate to get the electrons moving in those upper atmosphere electrons. But the blue and even into the violet are able to couple their energy much more effectively into those electron clouds. And that's why those colors are the ones that scatter. And the other colors, the reds, and, and the other colors like orange, tend to sail right through. All right, that is kind of the punchline here, but let's draw the actual scattering process. It's just gonna take a second. Let's say that we have the sun right here, and we have, you know, Jason right over here, on the ground right here. And I'm looking up far away from the sun into the sky, maybe right here, right? So what's going on is the sun is shooting out photons in all directions, but let's say I'm looking upward at the sky like this to some, you know, area of the sky like this. What am I going to see? Well, if it's blue light, so let me put the blue light here. This is like a blue photon, right? Then what's it going to look like? Well, this blue photon is able to put its energy into the electron clouds really efficiently. These electron clouds surrounding these atoms are shaking and they're acting like little antennas and they're re-radiating the energy. They're like absorbing the incoming energy, but then re-radiating in the energy into different directions. It's not exactly the same intensity in all directions, but that's a detail we don't need to get into here. More or less, it, it radiates in all directions a little bit more preferentially in some direction than others. When you study this stuff for real, you can get into the details, but it does something like this. This is called Rayleigh scattering. So when I look up at this portion of the sky, what I see is blue because the blue light was absorbed here and then re-radiated down to my eye. So this is what I see like this. So I see blue. Now, if I look at different portions of the sky, like if I look, let's say behind me here, let me put blue down, down below here. If I look over here, what am I going to see? It's the same sort of thing. The blue light's gonna go over here, and then you know it's gonna be some kind of pattern like this. Right? And so I'm going to see blue light. Now, when you look at different portions of the sky, you may see it more, more or less intensely blue. That has to do with the thickness of the atmosphere and the dust that's in the air, and there's all kinds of other things. But more or less, you see a various, you see various shades of blue when you look in the sky away from the sun. What happens when you look at the sun? And not at the sun when you're high in the sky, but at the sun whenever the sun is very low on the horizon. Let's look at that. Uh, let's look at that situation right here. Let's, before we do that, in this situation here, when I'm looking up at the sky, what does a red wavelength do? Red is going in this direction. It's also hitting the uh, atom, but it's not really interacting much with it. So the red photons just kind of go right through. So the red, the orange, the yellow, they mostly just go through. And that's why we look up here, we don't see red because blue is the one that's re-radiated down to the ground, All right? Now, let's do the same thing at sunset. At sunset, there's a sun over here and there's Jason over here, something like this. And there is a thick atmosphere kind of in the way. I guess I'll draw it, I guess I'll draw it kind of like this. 
So this is Earth. And this is sort of the boundary of the atmosphere. It's not exactly right because I got the sun a little bit too high. Maybe I'll draw this a little bit, a little bit higher, something like that. But when I'm looking at sunset, I am looking through a thicker part of the atmosphere. When I'm looking down low, I'm looking at like an, like an onion. I'm looking through a lot of air, right? But that sunlight is still passing through this very thick uh, portion of air. And every point along the way, the blue light is able to be scattered away, but the red light isn't really scattering because it's not able to shake the electron clouds. So what's the uh, red light going to do? The red light's going to come right through, and that's what I'm going to see, right? But what's a blue photon going to do? Blue photon's going to hit this, uh, this uh, molecule of nitrogen or whatever in the atmosphere, and then it's going to be absorbed and then re-radiated in different directions. So you might say, well, I'll, I'll see some blue light here, but here's the thing, there's a, another molecule right next door to it. So the photon emitted here is going to be absorbed by this one, and then it's going to be re-radiated. Something like this. And you might say, well, I'll see this photon here, but there's another one next door because I'm looking through a very thick part of the atmosphere. So every time it, it, it absorbs and re-radiates, the next molecule over absorbs it and then re-radiates and so on, and you lose a little bit in that process along the way. So if you're looking through many kilometers of atmosphere, the blue photons are basically all scattered away and they're scattered up out into space and down toward the ground, but they're not really going to your eye because they're kind of absorbed and re-radiated so much that they're sort of lost. They get scattered so much, the incoming energy from the sun is kind of scattered away in all directions. So you don't see this blue here at sunset. What you see is the red and the orange because it doesn't get absorbed by the atmosphere and it goes right through. That is why the sky is blue. That is why sunsets are red. Probably one of the most common questions that everybody has at one point in their life. I hope you've enjoyed this. Please follow me on to the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.